Hi, I'm Carrie Alonzo of St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health. And um, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. The Ramsey County Public Health and Social Services are hosting Facebook streams to promote awareness of mental health and well-being. Mental health is a widespread health problem. It impacts everyone, no matter age, income, race, ethnicity, or gender. And right now with COVID-19 pandemic, mental health Mental health is on top of everyone's mind and very important to address. And more than half have not access services due to barriers and stigma. Um, and we want to open, we want to take a chance to open the conversation and answer any common questions people might have around mental health. Today we have um, with us Dr. Richard Omni with Progressive Individual Resources talking about the whole family and immigrant and refugee families. Hi, Dr. Oni. Um, welcome. And if you want to introduce yourself. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good. Good. Thank you for inviting me to this session. Um, Again, like you rightly said, my name is Dr. Oni, and uh, I work for Progressive Individual Resources in St. Paul. Um, our programs, we work with a lot of uh, African immigrant refugees from the Sub-Saharan Africa that have been in Minnesota for you know, as far back as the time of immigration, which seemed to be in the high year 1990s when we have a lot of uh, Somali from East Africa, then people from West Africa, which finally uh, decided to receive services. And our agency was positioned to work with uh, those individuals. Um, personally, my background is in working with families that have challenges in the area of uh, intellectual developmental disability and uh, mental health issues. Um, I, I've been working with families for the past 20 years, and uh, I'm a co-founder of Progressive Individual Resources, and I have learned a lot from working with this cultural group of uh, population. Uh, currently, I also serve on different board members and advisory at the state uh, DHS level uh, that has to do with mental health issues. I serve 12 years under four different governors uh, by appointment. Governor Jesse Ventura, uh, Pelesky, and Dayton, and currently with uh, Governor Watts. So um, my purpose of joining those groups is to be able to learn the policies that guide those services so that I can better be informed and better be able to help those immigrant populations when it comes to service delivery and service uh, uh, decorations for their needs. And so uh, that has been part of what I do. And I've been very privileged to work with those families that taught me what I know I could do today. So that has been part of my little introduction. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oni. And, and we're just going to go through some common questions. So the first question is, what are some stigma that people might have around mental illness? Yes, just like uh, mainstream people, uh, I call them mainstream like American that are well uh, versed in the knowledge of mental illness, and yet they still don't come for services sometimes because of the stigma surrounding mental illness. Same also happened to the immigrant population. The way they view mental illness is really different. Even though mental health and mental wellness uh, is pretty universal. But when it comes to the immigrant population that I work with, the way they describe it and the way they experience it is the one that is different. And so it is my job as a practitioner to enable them understand that those stigma surrounding the way they see mental illness is not always true and that they should view mental illness as any type of physical health that has to do with diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, cancer, 
or any other physical health that people may have and willingly be able to discuss that or tell people. And also part of the issue why this is stigmatizing to the people is because of the community. The community where they live, they don't like to talk about mental health because they think someone is crazy, somebody is weak, and that is why they are feeling the way they are feeling. And so my job as a practitioner is to explain to them that when people are experiencing mental illness, that doesn't mean they are weak, and that doesn't mean they are sick to the level where they cannot recover. It's just a matter of accepting it and be able to walk through the illness. Um, the, the stigma is not by the people that are sick or that have illness. The stigma comes from the community. How the community treats people with mental illness seems to be what people are overly guarded against. They guide against that so much that they refuse to come for treatment. And it is my job to explain to them, encourage them for treatment so that things don't get worse for them. Great. And how do people talk or identify signs of mental illness? Um, they decline themselves. It's hard for them to identify, to say, oh, I'm having anxiety or I'm, I'm depressed. But the way they would describe it in view of symptoms and some of the way they describe them happen to be physical symptoms. For example, someone may say to me, oh, you know, all night I feel like um, somebody or a car just run over me. I got up in the morning, I'm so tired, I'm unable to do anything. I cannot even take my kids to daycare because I'm so tired. And they will say, oh, I did not eat yesterday. Uh, for the past few weeks now, my eating behavior has changed. They say that somebody may say they eat too much or they eat less. And sometimes people may just say, uh, for no reason, they start crying. Uh, when they start telling me all those symptoms that, that appear to be physical description, that is when I try to put the puzzle together to say, okay, if you are so sad for the past three months and you cry for no reason, then there may be something happening. You know, for me as a practitioner, I may say this is a sign of depression. I may start looking at treating the person or encouraging the person to receive depression um, treatment. So even though they are unable to describe them, their signs and symptoms in terms of clinical language, uh, I, they gave me enough information to be able to help them come up with the definition or description of what may be happening to them. So in general, they don't describe it themselves, but practitioners who are knowledgeable about the cultural uh, way of description may be able to put this together and develop a treatment plan for the individual or the family. So, thank you, Dr. Ross. So as a provider, it's important for us to be culturally aware of how people identify signs of mental illness. So yes. um, that's yes. very important. So what yes. are some different treatments or support that people can look for. Yeah. You just made a statement a, a while ago about how important it is for practitioners that work with different culture to be to be more of culturally uh, knowledgeable. Yes, culture really matters. Whatever yes. we do when it comes to mental health or any type of illnesses, culture does matter. So I really appreciate you putting that word there. Culture really matters for practitioners. Now, the next question is what? Yeah, uh, what are some different treatments or support that people can look for? Okay, well, a, a lot of time um, when I explain, when they finally ready to receive treatment, the question will be, what do I get? Do I get medication? Do I get this? Do I have this? So my question to you, uh, my response to them is usually, allowing them to understand the type of treatment that are available to them. For example, uh, explain to them that's what we call talk therapy, 
where you talk to individual practitioners that about your issues, about your family background. And I will also encourage them that, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions asked of them and they should not be frustrated when practitioners are asking those questions and that those questions will help the practitioner to direct them for the better treatment of their illnesses. And so um, I'd explain to them that it's what we call talk therapy. I would explain to them that sometimes people use medication if they are so on the high end of a continuum of the illness, that that medication might calm them down to the level where therapy can be more helpful um, and, and resourceful to them. I also let them know about maybe just doing some physical exercises can be part of combination of all those things. It could be three things at the same time, um, physical, maybe yoga, maybe minding, uh, set of uh, therapy, um, just different ways that they can receive therapy or services. Thank you. So right now, COVID-19, how is COVID-19 impacting our mental health and what can we do to improve it? Well, you know, COVID-19 also brings another dimension to this group of uh, population that I work with. Uh, for example, sometimes people may watch too much television and they see so much on television and they become very, very depressed. Uh, sometimes when people uh, listen to others, people calling them over the phone to tell them the experiences of what is going on, those can be very overwhelming to them and become very, people become very anxious. So it becomes very much of an anxiety provoking uh, for those people. And so it is important that um, when I talk to them and they are telling me all these stories, I just caution them to, to watch whatever they want to watch, but at the same time, be able to accept whatever is going on. And if it's too much for them to avoid watching some of those television. And also I encourage people that even though the situation now is isolation and they are not used, they, they are very uh, social beings. They like to be connected to their cultural group. What now is important is uh, it's not possible for them. So I encourage them to reach out to other uh, people through the phone usage, making phone call to them, um, if possible, sending them emails and just be able to be connected so that the isolation is not too much on them. Uh, it is important also to support them through their basic needs. For example, maybe delivering of food because some of these people are so afraid to even go out because they hear so much in the news. Even when the governor is giving the briefing about what is going on, how many dead we have in a day or in a week, uh, people just get swamped with those information and some people cannot handle it. And so it is important for us when we give information to selectively um, let people know what they can handle. And if people are feeling that they cannot handle it anymore, it is their job or responsibility to stay away. But pretty much follow all the protocol like washing your hand, sanitizing. Some people complain about sanitizing that um, they smell like alcohol and they don't like alcohol. Um, some people, their religions prevented them from even using sanitizer because of the smell of alcohol. And so it is the responsibility of the practitioners that work with individuals to know what individual skill level, what they can absorb and what they cannot absorb so that they can limit bombarding them with media information uh, mm -hmm. and then be able to be supported at all costs. Well, thank you, Dr. Oni, for taking time to um, interview with us and share some of your knowledge and wisdom. Before we end this interview, I have a last question. The question is, can someone with mental illness live a healthy lifestyle? Definitely. People with mental illness or individual illnesses that surround mental health or mental illness they can live a better life and healthy life. Um, what people need to do is 
to pretty much follow the the regiment of their treatment. Uh, if their medication, just like high blood pressure, people need to take their medication every day and take their template and take their um, uh, high blood pressure test. Also, the same thing with mental health, mental illness. That individual that are on medication need to take their medication very religiously, not just um, haphazardly. Uh, it is important also for people to, you know, based on the recommendation of their therapist or their provider, their doctor, their primary doctor, it is important they follow all the protocol because a lot of time this following this protocol will help them to to have a, a coping skill, a coping skill that will help them to navigate whatever their issues may be. So um, my encouragement is for them to let them know that yes, it may be a long haul, it may be a long process, but people do get better and get healthy. Well, thank you, Dr. Oni, once again. I hope you're staying well and staying um, safe. Thank you very much for what you do uh, as a public health practitioner and how your department is looking at uh, mental health promotion and mental well-being of the individual. I think we both, we need, we need the clinician and the public health together to work together. Uh, like the World Health Organization says that there can be no health without mental health. Mm -hmm. So that is what I see that you guys are doing at the county that I, that is really helping the families. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.